with the reading of today's scripture taken from the book of Luke chapter 11 verse 1 through 13 Once Jesus was in a certain place praying, as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said, This is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come. Give us each day the food we need. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. Then, teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose... He calls out from his bedroom, Don't bother me. The door is locked for the night and my family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. So I say to you, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, Do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So, if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Amen. Today's sermon, titled Learning to Us, will be delivered by Pastor Stephen Lackis. Good morning, everyone. The grace and peace of Christ be with us all today. Over these couple of months, as we focus on growing in our faith lives, one of the biggest challenges that we all face is learning how to pray. This sounds a little bit strange because, on the one hand, people outside the church always think of Christians as people who pray, people who know how to pray a lot. After all, prayer is a normal part of our faith lives. And every Sunday when we come here to church, we come here and pray in our church service. And most of us have experience at home praying by ourselves. So most people think about us Christians as people who pray a lot, people who know how to pray. But on the other hand, when we actually ask people, when we actually ask people in the church, Most Christians will say that they're not really very happy about their prayer lives at all. And we probably know that feeling. We feel like maybe we don't pray enough. We may pray occasionally when we remember to, and that's usually when we're in trouble or need something. But we also have that sense, we have that feeling that maybe we should really be praying more than this. A lot of times, we're not even sure really how to pray. If we had to stand up, if we invited people to come and stand up here in front of the church and lead a prayer, I think a lot of people would be really nervous. It's kind of nervous to stand in front of others and pray. I mean, are we doing it right? So let me tell you, if you feel this way, if you feel kind of nervous or confused or unsure, you're not alone. Lots and lots of people feel that way. Many, many Christians feel exactly the same way you do. So in that sense, it's nothing that you should feel too embarrassed about. We all feel somehow not really up to speed with our prayer life. But somehow we do still feel embarrassed. And that's because a lot of people think that prayer really is something that 
should just come naturally to us. A lot of people think that, well, if you're a Christian, you should just automatically know how to pray and be really good at it. Sometimes we hear people say, well, you know, praying is easy. Praying is just talking with God. And while that's true, if prayer really is so easy, why do, I, why do so many of us have such a hard time doing it? I don't think it's that easy. Today's Bible text, it gives us a good reminder that prayer is not something that's so natural or so easy at all. Instead, prayer is a skill that needs to be taught, just like any other skill. Jesus' own disciples, they understand this, and that's why they come to Jesus and they ask Jesus directly. They say to Jesus directly, teach us. Teach us, teach us how to do this thing called prayer. And that's why all through the history of the church, we've found so many different pastors and teachers and theologians who've all given advice, who've all given lessons even and courses on how to pray or have taught different ways of prayer. Our very own deacon, Amos, I'm not sure if Amos is with us this morning, but Amos, over the last few months, has been running some courses teaching people how to pray using those historical methods. And I really encourage you to give it a try, to join in. That's because prayer, prayer truly is something that we have to take time to learn. And just as with anything that we want to learn, whether it's playing a sport, whether it's learning a new musical instrument, if we're learning something, we also need to practice. It's only through learning about prayer and practicing that skill regularly, practicing that every day, that we can watch that skill then start to grow and to develop in our lives. The disciples, well, they watched Jesus pray, and that's what started this whole discussion today, the discussion we see in today's Bible story. The disciples, they watched Jesus pray and they wanted to have that skill too. They wanted Jesus to teach them how to do it. They realized that there's more going on here with prayer. That it's not just so simple and straightforward, but that there was something special and unique about what Jesus was doing. To give you an idea, to give you an idea of how mysterious and strange prayer can be, let me just give you one example. Have you ever noticed how much Jesus prays in the Bible stories? We read through those Bible stories and we find that Jesus prays a lot. Really, he's praying a lot. We see Jesus taking time out to go and pray. He goes off to quiet places to be alone and pray. He wakes up early in the morning to go and pray, and he prays too, just like us, when he's feeling in danger and need. This makes a lot of people think that Jesus was a very devout person. Jesus is a very religious person, someone who likes to pray a lot. But for us Christians, our faith is not that Jesus was a very religious person. That's not what we believe. We don't believe that Jesus was just a good and wise person or a good and wise teacher. We believe that Jesus Christ was our Lord and our God. Jesus is our Lord and God. Which really leaves us with a very, very strange question. Because if Jesus is God, why is he praying so much? We know we should pray, we know we should pray to God, and we do that when we pray to Jesus, but it kind of seems strange to see God the Son praying. What's going on here? What's, what's prayer all about if God himself in Jesus even prays? So when the disciples see Jesus praying, they grab the chance to ask him, to ask him what's going on, to ask him to teach them. And best of all, Jesus agrees. Now, we should note that in verse 2, Jesus doesn't promise to teach the disciples how he personally prays. He doesn't say to them, let me teach you how I do it. But instead, he gives them a lesson on how 
they should pray, on good ways for us to pray. And I think that's a good enough lesson for all of us too. Now, if the disciples were excited, if they were excited that Jesus said yes, if they were excited at this point about having Jesus teach them how to pray, I'm not sure if they stayed excited very long. That's because at first sight, the prayer that Jesus gives them really just seems very, very strange, very odd. On the one hand, Jesus' words, they don't really sound much like a prayer that we know today. It doesn't really sound much like the prayers that we say today. I mean, it doesn't even end in Amen. So that's really odd. I mean, what kind of prayer is that? Honestly, it feels a little bit more like a list of bullet points. Not so much a prayer as such, but rather a list of things to pray about. But if that's the case, when we look at this prayer, it seems to be missing a lot of things that we know we're also supposed to pray about. So, for example, we know that Jesus commanded us to pray for others, pray for the sick, to pray even for our enemies. But all of those points, they seem to be missing here when we just look at the prayer simply. But they are there, they are there, but we need to look closer to find them. And that's because Jesus' prayer, the one he teaches to his disciples, that's actually both of these things. It's doing both of these things. On the one hand, it is its own prayer. It's his own prayer that he gives to his disciples to pray. And that's why over the years, the disciples and the early church, they did their best to polish up that prayer, to make it really beautiful, make it something that we could use in the church, a beautiful and incredibly special prayer that Christians all through the church, all through history have prayed together. But on the other hand, it is kind of a list that reminds us what we can pray about. We shouldn't forget that Jesus wasn't just giving his disciples a prayer to repeat over and over again. He wasn't just saying to his disciples, well, whenever you pray, this is all that you have to say and say it over and over again. He was teaching them how to pray. How to pray. And that's why when we pray, we don't just only use the Lord's Prayer. Instead, this prayer it teaches us important principles. It teaches us principles that guide us in our praying. So yes, it's a prayer that we can say, but it's also an example. It's also a template that we can follow for our own praying. Now we could very, very easily spend a couple of months looking at today's scripture. It's got so much in it and it's so important. We could learn so much about prayer with Jesus over a long time, but we don't have that much time today. So let's just have a quick look at some of the really big and important points that we see here. We see the first and the most important point right away. We see it right at the very beginning in that simple word, Father. Jesus teaches us that when we pray, we should remember our closeness to God. We should remember our closeness to God and our closeness to one another. When we pray, we remember that God is our Father. But if God's our Father, that means also that we are all brothers and sisters. All of us together, we're all children of our Father, God. Because we're used to hearing that, we're used to hearing that so often, we're used to hearing God called Father, it's easy for us to forget how special that really is. It's easy for us to forget how special that relationship with God is. In this world, when we need things, especially important things, we feel like we need something, we need to solve a problem, what do we usually do? Well, a lot of us, we try to find someone to help us. And we don't just search for anyone, we try to find the most important people who can help us. So we search out connections. We search out connections to business leaders, to politicians, to judges. Some people even want to find a connection to the president right at the top. So we call up friends and we ask people, who has a good connection? 
Who has a good connection? Who can put us in touch with these important people so that we can get our problem heard and hopefully get them solved as well? Why do we do this? Why do we need to use these networks? Why do we need to use these guanxi to make connections to these important people? Why don't we just go straight to them? Well, we know that if we went straight to them, they wouldn't listen to us. Without those connections, those people probably wouldn't care about us at all. If we didn't have a friend or a relative or a business partner to pick up the phone and make that connection for us, those important people probably wouldn't even bother to talk to us. They wouldn't return our calls, they wouldn't answer our emails or our letters. They just ignore us because we're some kind of stranger. That's why those personal connections are really important. Because they open the door for us. They get us a chance to speak to those important people who can really, really help us. But God's not like that. That's not the way God is. Maybe so-called important people in our society, they don't really care about our problems. We're just normal, ordinary people. Maybe they don't want us to approach them and talk to them about our problems. But God's not like that. God always welcomes us. And we don't need to make some connection. We don't need to find someone to introduce us to God. We just ask God directly, speak to him directly, and he'll answer us. We just ask God, we just knock, and the door is opened for us. Unlike the president's office, there's no one standing at the door blocking us from getting through. And I think this is the first lesson that Jesus wants to give us about prayer. That when we pray, we don't need to be nervous. We don't need to be worried or think that God isn't listening. Remember that God, like a loving Father, He happily welcomes us. He welcomes us to come to Him any time, any time of the day, to share our problems, to share our worries with Him, regardless how big or small they may be. Even better, God encourages us to come and share good things with Him. Good things in our life, we should share those with God too. So just imagine, imagine if I went to all of the trouble of using my connections to get in touch with President Tsai Ing-wen, so organized a meeting, went there to her office, made the appointment, going to see her, and she's there at her desk with all the advisors standing around, and I said to her, you know, I just had a really good day today, and I want to let you know. They throw me out. They'd throw me out of there because I'm wasting her time. But our loving Father doesn't react that way. Our loving Father, God wants us to share our lives with Him. He wants us to come to Him. He wants us to share with Him our good times and our bad times. He wants us to know that we can come and talk to Him any time we need to. We easily forget how amazing that is. We easily forget that. That even though we are so small, even though we're so insignificant, the creator of the universe, he really does care for us. He really does want us to be close to him. That's why Jesus' second point is to remind us that when we pray, we should also take the time to praise God. To praise God and remember his holiness. But here, here we have to be careful. Here we have to be careful because a lot of people misunderstand what holiness means. For God, holiness doesn't mean being kept far away from us, from us normal and insignificant people. It doesn't mean being locked away behind big doors and stopping people coming close to him. God's holiness isn't like that. God's holiness is exactly the opposite. It's his willingness to like a father, to allow us to come close to him. Because God is holy, he doesn't push us away. Because God is holy, he doesn't reject us or look at us and our lives or our problems and think that we're unimportant. And isn't that a wonderful thing to praise God for? He is the creator God. 
He is the creator God, but he allows us to speak his name and to call him Father. He is the eternal and holy God, but he allows us to come right up to him as his own loved children and to speak with him about whatever we're concerned about. But prayer is not just about us. That's the third important lesson Jesus teaches us. Prayer is not just about us. When we pray, we shouldn't just think of ourselves, but we should think of others too. That's why we pray, May our Father's kingdom come. May your kingdom come. Kingdom sounds a bit strange. Kingdom sounds a bit strange to us today because we don't really have a lot of experience with kings. And kingdom, it actually really isn't the best translation of what this idea is trying to get at. That's because here, here we aren't talking about a particular piece of land. We're not saying this is a particular piece of land that's God's kingdom, which is next door to other kings' kingdoms. It's not like that. Instead, the idea is that wherever in the world we see God's love and power, wherever we see them ruling, that's where we see God's kingdom. Because when we look around us and see people hating each other, when we look around us and we see violence and greed and rejection and killing, in those places we see sin ruling. In those places we see sin ruling people's lives and making them slaves. But in places where we see people loving each other, in places where we see people caring for each other, that's where we see God's will really reigning. Like we saw last week when we looked at the story of the Good Samaritan, in those places where we care for others, in those places where we feed the hungry and reach out a helping hand to those in need, that's where we see God's kingdom. In those places where we care for the sick and the imprisoned, where we work for peace and friendship, and where we love our enemies, that's where we see real, real examples of God's rule in this world. So when you smile at someone and share a kind and encouraging word with them, there, there is the kingdom of God. When someone at work or school has a problem and you lend a hand, there is the kingdom of God. That's why whenever we say this prayer, we remind ourselves also of our responsibility as disciples, our responsibility to cooperate with God, to help out, to help God's reign really spread out through the whole world to reach out into all of those dark corners and hopeless places. We're reminded not only to pray for those in need, but after praying, to also go out into the world and share God's love with others. So this idea of cooperating, this idea of cooperating with God, that brings us to the next lesson. Give us today our daily bread. On the one hand, this is an important reminder for us to be thankful for the food and the support that we get from God every single day. If God didn't provide for us, there would be no way for us to survive. So when we pray, it's only right and good to thank God, to give thanks to God, not only for the food that we need every day, but for all the other millions of ways that he supports us in our lives day by day. But on the other hand, this is also a good reminder to us that the food that we receive every day usually comes to us through the hands of other people. Our daily food, that food that we need every day, it, does, it doesn't just miraculously pop out of the air. It doesn't just miraculously pop out from heaven and come to us. Other people work hard to grow it, work hard to prepare it for us, and have it ready for us to eat. That's often what mums and dads complain about, that kids forget that the food doesn't just miraculously appear on the dinner table, that mums and dads work hard to get it there on the table. So at home, it's often the hands and hard work of our mums and dads, of our husbands and wives. They're the ones that 
prepare that food for us to enjoy every day. So while it's very, very true, it's very true that ultimately all things come to us from God, and we should thank God for that, we shouldn't forget to pray and give thanks for those many hands who pass those, those gifts along to us too. Especially those people who are working, working hard to support us in our own homes. Now, the fifth part. The fifth part of this prayer, that's probably the most frightening part, or the most worrying part of all. Forgive us our sins, just as we forgive everyone who sins against us. On the one hand, this sounds really wonderful. Because here, Jesus teaches us to confess our sins to God when we pray, and to ask for God's forgiveness. We have a real promise here of good news, that God pours out his grace to us. He pours out his mercy and love on us, and he does, he really does forgive our sins. That part really is wonderful. The worrying part, the troublesome part, that's the second part of the sentence. Just as we forgive everyone who sins against us. That's a worry because here we find that little word as, just as we do this. And that little word as, that means that God should follow our example. God should follow our example in, fo in forgiving sins, that God should forgive us in just the same way that we forgive other people. But that's a worry because often we forget to forgive other people. And if we aren't forgiving others, if we aren't passing on and sharing God's forgiveness with others, then that doesn't sound so good for us. That sounds a little bit risky. And actually Jesus stressed that. Jesus stressed that point just a few chapters earlier in chapter 6. He tells his disciples... The measure you give will be the measure you receive back. The measure you give will be the measure you receive back. So here Jesus reminds us to ask for God's forgiveness when we pray. That's a really important point. But also to remember to always share that forgiveness with others. To give God's grace and mercy and love out to everyone that we meet. And really that's not easy. It's not easy for us to do that. It's very easy for us to want forgiveness. That's not bad, but it's not easy for us always to forgive others, especially when they hurt us a lot. That brings us to the last part. Help us, help us not to give in to temptations. When we pray, it's easy to get focused just on ourselves because that's the way we are. We're often very focused on our own needs. And that's what temptation is really all about. Temptation is when we fall into that trap of only ever just thinking about what we want. Temptation just is like that. We forget to look abroad. We forget to look outside us at others. And whether that temptation is the temptation not to pass forgiveness on to others, whether it's the temptation to forget to love others, whether it's the temptation to steal what doesn't belong to us, the temptation to turn our backs on those in need, or even if it's the temptation to just eat the whole chocolate cake ourselves and not leave any for anyone else, the temptation is always the same. That temptation always pushes us to think just of, ourselves, just to think of me and not to look at others or to remember others. Temptations tempt us to turn our backs on what we know is the right thing to do. That's why Jesus encourages us when we pray, we should also pray for the strength not to do that, to pray for the strength and to pray for the courage to do what we know is right, to pray for the strength to help others, to share love with others, to consider others. It's only through prayer and practice 
And it's only through God's help that we can only ever have the strength to say no to temptation. So, in teaching us to pray, Jesus doesn't just give us sentences to memorize. He doesn't just give us sentences to repeat. Instead, he teaches us to focus on important parts in our own spiritual lives, our life with God and also our lives with others. When we pray, remember that God is our Father, the one who cares for us, the one who gives us good things. He encourages us to come to him in prayer and whatever our problems or concerns may be, we can share those with God. God is the Holy One. And that means that he's always there. He's always there ready to listen to us. His door is always open. He doesn't keep himself far away from us. He doesn't block the way for us. He calls us to come right up close to him and share whatever our concerns are with him. He invites us to come to him as a loved child and be in his arms. God also encourages us to work with him to help the rule of his love and grace spread throughout the whole world. He encourages us to give thanks in all things, not just to thank him as our heavenly father, but to also thank all of those people around us who help us every day. Hardest of all, as we saw, hardest of all, Jesus demands that we share that love and forgiveness with all people, that we be generous with our forgiveness to others, especially if we want God to be generous in his forgiveness to us. It's a great temptation, a great temptation to want to keep all of the good things just for ourselves, to put ourselves first and to seek our own benefits first. But Jesus encourages us to pray for strength to defeat those many temptations that come from selfishness. So we need strength. We need strength and God's help to do what's good for everyone, not just what's good for ourselves. We need strength and courage to stand up for what's right and true. And that's what Jesus encourages us to pray for. But there's one last point. There's one last point we need to come back to. Because in Jesus' lesson on prayer, there's one final point that's hidden through the whole prayer. A point that we often miss. And that's that this prayer is not actually for me to say. And it's not a prayer for you to say either. Instead, it's a prayer that we are supposed to say together. It's a prayer for us. So this prayer, this prayer is a prayer that we join together in saying. We often forget that because when it comes to prayer, we often do that on our own. We're not often praying with other people. So it's easy for us to forget that in prayer we're in it together. Jesus doesn't tell us to pray to my heavenly Father or to ask for my daily bread or to even ask for the forgiveness of my sin. Instead, we pray together to our Father. We pray for all of us together. We pray for all of our needs. Because we pray a lot by ourselves, as I said, it's easy for us to forget that. But I don't think that's a good thing to forget. We have to remember that prayer is something we do together. To remember this togetherness of prayer, well, that's one reason why some people hold hands together when they pray. You may have seen people do this. You may do this yourselves at home when you pray together with other people. It's a nice reminder that we are connected to other people, that we pray together in this way, that we're part of a community. I think it's too easy for us to forget this communal part of prayer. But we are really a community. We're a community of brothers and sisters praying for each other, We're a community of brothers and sisters looking out for each other. But it even goes deeper than that. Remember before we asked that strange question, why does Jesus pray? Why does the Son of God, why does God the Son pray? That seems so odd to think that even God prays. Why would God pray? 
But it's a beautiful and important thing that we learn when we look at Jesus. Because Jesus teaches us that God is not simply one. Jesus teaches us that God is three in one. God is a trinity. And these three persons of God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, they spend all eternity communicating and speaking with one another, speaking among themselves. And that's what prayer is. Prayer is this bond of connection between the Father, Son, and Spirit. And this is where we see the really wonderful thing about prayer. Because not only do the Father, the Son, and the Spirit hold hands in prayer with one another, the wonderful thing is that they reach out their hands to us and invite us to join the prayer together with them. In prayer, we get to hold hands in community, not just with each other. We also get to take God's hand. We also get to be included in that wonderful heavenly circle of prayer between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. That's what makes prayer so amazing. And that's what makes it something that we want to do more and more every day. So let's pray together now. Loving God, there is no way that we can thank you enough for your great love for us. You care for us, you provide for us, you lead us and guide us. You don't keep yourself far away from us, but like a loving father, you invite us and encourage us to come close into your arms and share all of our thoughts and worries with you. Help us to take advantage of this wonderful gift of prayer. Help us to join you every day in your holy life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and pray our communal confession together, redevoting our lives to Christ, and remembering to forgive others just as God has forgiven us. Let's pray together. Most merciful God, we confess to you before the whole company of heaven and one another, that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins, heal us by your Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all of our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us following the way of Jesus Christ. Amen.